You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Niku Madhusudan is a professor of astrophysics and exoplanetary science at the Institute of Astronomy, University of Cambridge. He is credited with developing the technique of atmospheric retrieval to infer the compositions of exoplanets. Madhusudan obtained a BTEC at the Indian Institute of Technology, Varanasi, before pursuing an MS and PhD at MIT. His doctoral advisor was Sarah Seeger. Niku Madhusudan, welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, Doctor, characterizing exoplanets with JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, has been one of the more exciting things in addition with probing the very beginnings of the universe that this telescope was capable of doing. Well, now we have a characterization from JWST and your team. What did you find? So we, uh, the, the central finding is that for the first time, we detected carbon-bearing molecules in the atmosphere of a planet in the habitable zone around its star. And that in itself is a major advancement in the field because for more than a decade, we have been trying to do this with the James Webb's predecessor, which was the HST and other facilities. And we have never been able to detect methane uh, in a temperate exoplanet robustly. And that was actually called the missing methane problem. And with just two observations with the James Webb Space Telescope, we've solved a more than a decade-long uh, mystery in the field. So, so just by that, just from the methane detection, it's already a big deal. It is. And we're lucky in that this planet is close and orbits a red dwarf. Therefore, by the transit method, you can really look in there and start teasing out the details. How strong is the methane detection? So it's, it's very strong. It's in statistical terms, it's called a five sigma detection. So that's more than 99.9999, even more percent confidence. So that's at the three is basically the bare minimum for astrophysics. Yeah. So this is well yeah. above that. So you, well above that, yeah. you've, you've got methane and you've got two observations. Yeah. So we, yeah. And we also got carbon dioxide at uh, three sigma confidence, which is also pretty good. Yes, and carbon dioxide is interesting because that's a common gas for planetary atmospheres. To, so to see it isn't that surprising. But also there's the question of hydrogen, and that was a previous detection. Yeah. Now, how does that play in with the existence of these gases? Yeah, so in, in, a, in a terrestrial planet, like in terrestrial planets in the solar system, uh, rocky planets, carbon dioxide is very common. But to be seeing that in a hydrogen-rich atmosphere, in the habitable zone, which is a low temperature, Earth-like atmospheric temperatures, which are pretty low by general planetary standards, uh, exoplanet standards, to see both methane and carbon dioxide, but to not see something like ammonia, which you would expect in a hydrogen-rich atmosphere. And that is the, is the bit that's very interesting. So to give you some context, if you look at the solar system giant planets, all of them have hydrogen-rich atmospheres, deep hydrogen-rich atmospheres, and all of them have some amounts of methane and ammonia in them. Okay? And not so much CO2 and small amounts of CO maybe, but a lot of methane and ammonia. And this planet, K218b, what we see is that it does have a hydrogen-rich atmosphere. It does have a lot of methane, but it does not have ammonia. Now, that is a smoking gun for you. So there is something going on that is not common to solar system giant planets. And on top of that, you have a lot of carbon dioxide. Now, if you put all of those things together, having a lot of methane, a lot of carbon dioxide, not having ammonia, not having carbon monoxide to significant levels. All these things basically, if you try to explain them with across the planetary chemistry that we are currently aware of, atmospheric chemistry, the only plausible way we could do that is if there were an ocean underneath a thin hydrogen-rich atmosphere. And this is not something that we came up with after the data. This has been predicted in the last few years by various theoretical modeling studies of atmospheric chemistry on such planets. So they predicted that you should be seeing a depletion of ammonia and you should be methane and CO2 
and so on should be relatively abundant but not ammonia now that pattern is exactly what is being seen here and that is what gives us the confidence to infer the presence of a possible ocean underneath the atmosphere now is there also not a detection of water vapor uh no so it, there was uh, previously what happened was that with the hst uh, observations few years ago four years ago there was a claim of a water vapor inference but then studies in the meantime between then and now have shown that that is uh, what is known as degenerate uh, with an ammonia uh, with a uh, methane feature meaning that in the hst wavelength range we were looking at both water and methane have strong features so so it's hard to tell them apart so after the initial inferences of water vapor it quickly became inconclusive with follow up uh, theoretical studies and what we are finding now is that indeed it wasn't water it was uh, mostly a methane that we were seeing water could well be there it's just not at detectable levels not compared to methane for example Interesting. And so this this is this is difficult science. Yeah. So it, things can mimic other things in these spectra yeah. and how do you how do you nail that down? How do you tease them out? Yeah, and that is why the broad wavelength range of JWST was so crucial because with this spectra that that you must have seen now what we are seeing is multiple features when you if you have just one feature which is what the problem was with our previous uh, hst observations if you have just one or two features in a limited wavelength range then features from different molecules can mimic each other but if you have a wide wavelength range then not all those features overlap and that is how you sort of break the degeneracy so to speak break the confusion between different molecules and we were able to do that with james webb and now we have five peaks which can be attributed to methane so it's really clear water may well be there but it's not at very high detectable limits and which is consistent with having a cold stratosphere in in this planet so the short answer is that if you want to detect molecules robustly you need a wide wavelength range and very high sensitivity which is what james webb provides I'm not sure it comes across as well as it should when we talk about exoplanetary science that these worlds are dynamic yeah. just like Earth is and then Mars and Venus and that they're going to be tricky to characterize but we can get the basics and start yeah. thinking about it but it's really it's tough and I I definitely don't envy you guys working in that because you can get false positives and all sorts of things but yeah. somebody's got to do it it's time absolutely and that's what uh, data like this allow us to do is that this is literally the starting uh, of of a, of a of an era uh, in in that sense is that for the first time we are able to even tell the presence of these molecules at 3 to 5 sigma level which is a huge deal if you think about carbon based molecules in small habitable zone planets and with more and more observations this is going to be refined much further but at least we can we have proof of concept that it can be done Absolutely. Now working with the data set from Webb, you're actually the first scientist I've been able to talk to that that is really working into it with, you know, past setting it up. How good is that telescope to work with as an astronomer in this regard? It 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 is phenomenal to <laughs> to say the least. No one as has ever seen data like this for exoplanet spectroscopy. Okay? Just to give you like a rough idea, we were talking uh, a few minutes ago about the hst water vapor inference now that was using 60 hours of hst time looking at eight transits of this planet in front of the host star and binning the data from all those eight transits which were obtained over the course of 2 to 3 years okay so that is the amount of data that it took with hst which you know is a remarkable facility in and of itself and has served us for many decades very well right so it took that much time with hst to get that detect that inference of water vapor in a small wavelength range one or two peaks and with james webb you have much wider range 1 to 5 micron previously it was just 1 to 1.8 micron roughly now we have much wider wavelength range and with just two transits which is about 14 hours with jwst we are getting much much higher signal to noise much stronger detections of multiple molecules of the same planet you know that should give you a sense of scale for how good it is absolutely now any hope in looking for something like oxygen in the atmosphere of not just this exoplanet but any of them i mean can we do we have the wavelengths for that to look for high oxygen levels 
Yeah, so oxygen is a tricky one uh, because if you're thinking about oxygen, you're thinking you're probably thinking about a rocky planet. Now, the problem with rocky planets is that they're small, their atmospheres are heavier if you think of Earth-like atmospheres. So characterizing their atmospheres are much, much harder compared to the kinds of planets we are talking about here, these Haitian worlds with hydrogen-rich atmospheres. So, I mean, it can be done in principle, but you need order 100 hours or more and very dedicated observations, even with JWST, around the smallest of stars. Right. So it's really, really difficult to do those observations. Now, the Haitian worlds, that, that yeah. these were actually predicted before, you know, this, this was a candidate for that before this research. Yeah. So now it looks like this might be one, but it is a very, very different planet from Earth. So what are the overall characteristics of, of this planet, K218b? Yeah, so, so I would call this as a triumph in the, in the bridge between astrophysical theory and observations. So we actually predicted the possibility of Haitian worlds a few years ago, the characteristics being a thin hydrogen-rich atmosphere uh, overlying a planet-wide ocean, basically. So you have a planet that is dominantly made of water, which means this interior mantle would be a lot of water ice. It could have a rocky core, but a large water ice mantle, but a surface, a layer of liquid water. And that is the defining feature is that it's a planet with planet-wide oceans underneath a thin hydrogen-rich atmosphere. And with the condition in the ocean, the conditions like the pressure and temperature at the ocean surface being similar to what you would see on Earth. And that is what makes it habitable. Now, habitability. Now, with with it, that ocean under with an underlying amount of ice, there it doesn't have much yeah. <laughs> connection to the actual nutrients and geology. So, are these Haitian worlds, in addition to being very large, a n- number of times larger than Earth, yeah. then that makes them not such a great candidate for life? But we really don't know. Yeah. But at the same time, they, while habitable and with liquid water, perhaps yeah. they may not be so good for life, right? Yeah, so, so I, I, I'll just make a, a quick correction uh, or just clarification that the water is over the ice layer. Okay, So there is the icy interior and then there is a liquid water layer on top. That is the definition for these Haitian worlds. And then on top of the liquid water layer is the hydrogen atmosphere. So that is the setup. Now, you're right in that it won't have access to the same nutrients and nutrient cycles as we think of on terrestrial planets, like from the silicate weathering and so on. But actually... Earlier this year, in another paper, before these observations, by the way, we had predicted pathways for how you can have nutrients in such planets. And interestingly, if we just took similar histories of accretion through asteroids and so on of rocky material onto the planet in its early history, or if you take sedimentation from the atmosphere of condensates, silicate and iron-rich condensates, we, can, we showed that you can actually get these similar nutrients like the carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, and so on. Those you can get in the ocean. So it is not clear that nutrient scarcity is the problem for such planets. Of course, this is still very early days and someone needs to work out theoretically what the various biochemical pathways would be and what the food processing pathways would be. But it doesn't seem like that would be a fundamental limitation for these planets. It also has to be said, now there's carbon, carbon bearing molecules. So carbon is there. Yeah, exactly. And who knows what gets delivered to these planets? I mean, yeah. what is a what is a, what does a late heavy bombardment look like in a, in a star system like this? You know, and exactly. what do we know? Yeah. So gravity. Now, this is going to be a very different type of world in that it's going to have much higher gravity. What does that do to the ocean? In other words, if you were to go to this exoplanet and say it had an ocean, mm. would it be like perfectly calm with no, <laughs> you know, no movement at all? Or would it would it still have some dynamic ability? do you think yeah so so we haven't fully this is a very new concept of a planet so we haven't fully explored that region of the parameter space on how the ocean dynamics would operate on Haitian worlds what uh, we have shown in recent studies is how deep the oceans can be before you hit the icy bedrock uh, of, of the planet And what we find is that the oceans in these sorts of planets can be very, very deep compared to what we know of on Earth. Uh, The deepest oceans would be ordered 10 kilometers or less. 
whereas on these planets you could have oceans that are 100 kilometers deep so how exactly the dynamics operates in such oceans is still like a very open question but then the surface dynamics there could also be winds on these planets which could uh, drive similar surface dynamics uh, atmospheric surface interactions as we see on earth but it is still too early to speculate on what the ocean dynamics would be like that's going to be interesting though because as you figure that out you know you start to run up against the idea of tidal locking and as far as i'm aware k218b may be tidally locked yeah so then you end up with with what currents do you have to transfer heat and things like that as far as habitabilities of these exoplanets right yeah i mean it's interesting you mentioned about tidal locking because one uncertainty in uh, for for k218b in particular is that we do say that the atmospheric chemistry suggests you need a water layer but what is what is not clear is how hot that water layer would be right so it could be a habitable temperature similar to those in earth's oceans but it could also be very hot in fact too hot to host life so that parameter space is not very well constrained on the other hand, what you can also have due to tidal locking is that the day side may be too hot to be habitable, but the night side could still be habitable because you have a permanent night side. See, so there are all these interesting effects that come in that we are not very really familiar on Earth. So this sort of planets, these Haitian worlds, open a wide range of possibilities for atmospheric surface processes as well as the habitability. Now, what of, with this type of planet, the Haitian world, what of an eyeball world? Now, we look at those things for systems like TRAPPIST-1, that, that maybe these terrestrial worlds, Earth-sized terrestrial worlds, might have a zone of habitability in the twilight area. Yeah. Is that the same with the Haitian world? It is very much possible. Again, we can we can only guess at this point. We don't have data on this, but theoretically it is possible. And we actually came up with this concept of dark Haitian worlds. So in our original definitions of Haitian worlds, we said the Haitian worlds would be habitable across the planet, but there can be scenarios where it is tightly locked and the day side is too hot to be habitable, then your habitability would be restricted to a region on the night side, which is permanently dark. So we would call those the dark Haitian worlds. And we came up with the, another category, which is a case where you would have these planets floating in outer space very far or very far from the star with very little radiation from the star. Turns out hydrogen is a really good greenhouse gas. So in which case, even without much radiation from the star, you could still have surface habitable conditions just from hydrogen even, and the interior heat, even if there is no radiation from the, from the star. So those we call cold Haitian world. So there are all these interesting possibilities when you have a water layer and a hydrogen rich atmosphere on top. It allows for many different combinations in which habitability can occur. So yeah, so we just have to be open to the diversity of worlds out there in our search for habitable environments and life. That's going to be the fun part, though, because we're right at the beginning and here we have a candidate. Now, other candidates for Haitian worlds, there's been some talk that now this this particular one, K218b is the best one, but that the Kepler mission may have found others. How, how common could the Haitian world be around a red dwarf, which is the most common type of star in the universe? Yeah, so Kepler has found a few and then the test mission, NASA's test mission actually has also found quite a few and we're looking for more. At, as a bottom line, I would say these Haitian worlds would, would be much, much more common and observable compared to rocky planets, for example, habitable rocky planets. And the simple reason for that is that based on the planetary demographics, we, we have a census, rough census from based from, from the Kepler mission and other surveys, we have a census of sorts of the planet radius or size distribution in the solar neighborhood. And what we are finding is that planets in the sub-Neptune regime, which is between terrestrial sized rocky planets and ice giants, which are about four Earth radii uh, in radius, in that range is where the distribution actually peaks. So planets in the sub-Neptune region really peak, uh, dominate the exoplanet population, which gives us the data point that these Haitian worlds, which fall in that same sub-Neptune regime, should be much, much more common than terrestrial-sized planets. Now, the star itself, K218b itself, is a, a cool red dwarf. Yeah. And these are often, some say they are probably not very good for life because some of them tend to be flare stars, yet some of them seem to be quiescent. Yeah. 
Then you also have the argument that maybe they flare closer to their poles and they leave their planets alone in their ecliptic planes. So what bearing does that have on Hyacian worlds? In other words, get the wrong red dwarf, can it strip its atmosphere? <laughs> you know, but you get the right one and there it is. Is it that sort of dependent? Is there a dependency on the type of red dwarf it's dealing with and the character of the star? Yeah, so uh, to, to zeroth order, that, that statement is correct, is that it, it, it depends a lot on the stellar activity, and we know that stellar activity can have adverse effects on planetary environments and, uh, and indeed the possibility of life there. So, so that's definitely true. Question is, how much activity is needed to obliterate life or obliterate the atmosphere? That, that has not been established yet for, for Haitian worlds. For this particular planet, K218b, the, the estimates vary, uh, but one could argue that it could be of moderate activity. And it's not clear if that level of activity is enough to preclude habitability on the planet. Now, that is a calculation that needs to be done. And then there is also the point of what happens on the night side if uh, it's tightly locked and you have a permanent night side the flares the activity that you see may not affect the night side as much which uh, could have more habitable conditions so there are all these combinations that are worth looking another uh, fundamental question to ask is that we have thought uh, there is a lot of literature on how activity and stellar flaring stuff adversely affects life and habitability on rocky planets what is not so clear is how it affects habitability on planets with hydrogen-rich atmospheres, which is what these Haitian worlds would be. And the reason we don't know is because these are so this this class of planets has uh, has been discovered only very recently, and th those calculations haven't happened yet. Another one that people are probably going to be, you know, as, as they sit and imagine, like I am, these these worlds. What about land? I mean, in that level of gravity, which I think what K218b is what, 8.6 times the mass of Earth. I mean, can you envision even having land on a planet like that or has that work not been done? So it is, uh, if we are going solely by the data that we have at hand, then it is very difficult to have a land mass under a shallow atmosphere uh, in tandem with an ocean on this planet. That just cannot happen. So if you, if you think the planet is habitable at all, and if we think there is an ocean on it, then there cannot be land mass. And there is a reason for that. It's because the density is too low to allow for that. If you have a silicate layer and a land mass, then you need a much thicker layer of hydrogen and some significant amount of water ice that to explain the observed mass and radius, in other words, the density of the planet. So you can't have land masses exposed to the atmosphere, to a thin atmosphere. Interesting worlds indeed. Now, this exoplanet does not appear to be alone in its system. There appears to be a K218c. Yes. Now, given that we're dealing with a red dwarf system, these planets are probably pretty close into each other. They're certainly close into the uh, red dwarf. So could they be tidally interacting with each other? Yeah, so they, they could be. We don't know that yet for sure, but uh, I wouldn't discount that possibility. What would that look like? I mean, would that actually, because I don't know what the mass of the, the second planet is, and if it's interacting in a certain way, I mean, could that be creating tides, you know, a tidal effect on K218b that might also play into that, that convection that might be happening? Yeah, that, that, that is very much a possibility. Uh, the, the other planet is located interior to this particular planet and its mass is uh, somewhere around six Earth masses, but there is only a minimum mass constraint. There is no inclination measurement. So, so in other words, the mass is not known exactly. Only a minimum mass estimate is known for that particular planet because it, I don't think it transits the star I mean, you need the planet to transit the star to measure its radius. Now, that's a bit of a technical jargon there. But the point is, the bottom line is that we only know a minimum mass of that planet and we don't know enough about its size or so on. So we can't put a handle on what that planet could have been made of. But what we can say is that it is interior. It orbits uh, its star interior to the orbit of K218b. And it would be close enough that there could be tidal effects on K218b as well. So it, it is too early for me to speculate on what the tidal interactions would be like between the two planets, but I, I wouldn't be able to rule it out at this point. Stepping outside into the hypothetical for a moment, that may not be what's going on in the system, but it's just a general idea yeah. that if you got that going, 
All right. Now, one of the big questions within astrobiology is what effect does the moon and the tides, what effect did they have on abiogenesis on Earth and were they essential? Yeah. And our yeah. moons, you know, I mean, we don't really see almost double planet systems like Earth and the moon. We yeah. don't really see that yeah. in the solar system as much. They might be rare, but could this this idea of a red dwarf with two planets interacting tidally actually work as a proxy and mitigate that question you know and you know maybe make that question less weighty in that maybe the tides can happen between planetary systems and interactions between these worlds around red dwarfs that 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 is a an interesting thought <laughs> it is definitely possible that tides would have some effect but there are too many uncertainties at this point to make a conclusive statement because currently we have a rough region of possibilities for this planet as to what its interior could be like we're saying it could it uh, it should have a water ocean layer and so on but we need more observations to really precisely confirm that the presence of the ocean and then we should be able to put limits on the mass fractions on of the ocean we already have some limits but we want uh, precise limits and then one needs to do a theoretical calculation on how the tidal interactions would affect uh, the planet K two eighteen B given the constraints on its uh, inter- internal structure. So, so we would be jumping too far ahead on what we know at this stage, but we can't rule out the possibility that uh, the, there could be significant tidal interactions between the planets, and that could those could lead to interesting effects. The idea of the Hessian worlds in general. All right, we're talking about red dwarfs. Yeah. But what about this concept when you start stepping up the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram? You what about type K? What about type G? What about type F? Can bigger stars, hotter stars also support Hessian worlds or is this entirely a red dwarf thing according to the models you guys are working with? Yeah, no, the, the planet itself is the, the, the type of planet itself, the Hyacinth dwarfs are not restricted to red dwarfs. They could be around any kind of star. It's just that the, the distance there from the star would change depending on the stellar spectral type. So, for example, and it's, it's the same if you take a rocky planet and if you say how close can it be to the star and still be habitable, it will be very, very close for a red dwarf. But if you take a sun-like star, it will be close to 1 AU, which is why the Earth is habitable. So the same would hold true for uh, these Haitian worlds as well. And there will be it's somewhat, some differences in the temperature structure of the atmosphere because the stellar radiation is going to be different between an M dwarf and more massive stars. But qualitatively speaking, they would still be habitable. Now, one interesting thing, which, which you may find very interesting, in fact, is that for the Haitian worlds, the inner habitable, uh, the inner boundary of the habitable zone is restricted to a certain distance, depending on the star. But it basically has no limit on how far you can be. It can be from the star and still be habitable. So, in principle, these Haitian worlds could be floating in free space without the, a star at all and could still be habitable. And the reason for that is that their internal heat is sufficient to keep the surface in liquid phase, and the hydrogen layer would act as a greenhouse and keep the water intact so so that is the promise of these worlds is that you have a much larger catchment area in terms of habitable zone to find such planets and and that's one of the promise of Haitian worlds just to be clear we're talking about Haitian rogue planets that yeah. could be habitable and wandering not only just the galaxy but intergalactic space <laughs> and having been ejected or whatever and then that's a habitable zone to, could you call it could you call this and i'm going out on a limb here the universal habitable zone um, I, <laughs> I i wouldn't go okay i will excuse myself from speculating <laughs> that that far but uh, i'm merely stating a physical effect that these planets could in fact not be uh, around any star and still be habitable and this is an effect actually that has been predicted for rocky planets free floating rocky planets with hydrogen rich atmosphere so that concept is is not new but when applied to Haitian worlds it makes it even more important because the, the range of masses and radii allowed are huge so you have many more planets that fit into that category 
Now, a nuts and bolts astronomy question about characterizing exoplanet atmospheres. You're deeply into this field and you're the perfect person to ask because it's never really been clear to me why this is. So we look at red dwarfs yeah. and for transits and it's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Why does it get harder when you look at orange dwarfs or stars like the sun when you're looking with a telescope trying to characterize that atmosphere and the transits? Why does it seem to get harder to do the bigger the star? Yeah, so that's a very good question and I'm glad you asked that. It's because when you get the spectroscopy, uh, observe the spectra of these planets, the signal you get, the amplitude of the spectral features you get is basically proportional to the area of the planet disk over the area of the star. So it's square of the radius, square of the size ratio. Which means that for a smaller star, if you keep the planet fixed, a smaller star will give you a smaller denominator, so a higher ratio, so higher signal. And the bigger you make the star, the bigger you make the denominator, so your size ratio, uh, your, your uh, signal uh, goes smaller. So that, that, in a nutshell, is the fundamental problem, is that the bigger you make the star, the smaller the contrast, the planet to star contrast becomes, and the harder it becomes to detect the atmospheric features of the star. Do larger aperture space telescopes in the future help to overcome this problem? Will it become easier to look at, at, yes. at siblings of the sun or whatever for exoplanets like this and characterize the atmospheres? Absolutely, absolutely. It's a pure signal to noise problem. There is one other problem, which is that the transit during the distance from the star also increases. As I said earlier about the habitable zone, if you have a bigger star, your planet needs to be farther to maintain the same temperature. So there is that effect also, but that, that is a more manageable. You just have to look at it for longer, over a longer period of time. But the fundamental limiting factor is the, uh, is the signal to noise requirement. So yes, so increasing the aperture size would, would definitely make it better. It's also worth noting too that, the, as you said, this was really difficult with Hubble much easier with web Absolutely. and with future telescopes it gets better and better and better until we can really start characterizing them around any star where you could expect a habitable planet when you start going above type f it doesn't look like <laughs> it doesn't look like they're you're, you're going to get habitability there because of the you know short lifetime of the star but yeah it is slightly difficult yes <laughs> and the fact that i mean it goes up from there yeah don't look at beetlejuice yeah yes <laughs> if, you, <laughs> yeah. if you want to find a haitian world <laughs> exactly exactly all right so other candidates now do you have other as far as the haitian world hypothesis goes do you have other good candidates to look at, whether with web or not? And yeah. if can you actually study these things without even using web? If you can't get time, can you get time on a different telescope or whatever to continue the search for other examples of Haitian worlds? Yeah, so there are several other candidate Haitian worlds. So we have identified about a dozen candidate Haitian worlds that are feasible for atmospheric characterization with web. With other telescopes, it is not clear. Definitely, I mean, with Hubble, for example, you could invest a ton of time and get small signatures, which may or may not be diagnostic. So with other facilities, I'm, I don't think it is as feasible, but with web, for sure. And we have, as I said, identified nearly a dozen candidates, which if we put a modest amount of time into them, now it looks feasible. The Kepler spacecraft, and now this found many, many, many exoplanets through the transit method, which it was built for, which is key to my statement. Yes. Now, yes. Webb is more generalized than that, and really it was built for looking at early galaxies. But if you were given unlimited funds, you know, NASA, here, 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 yeah. build us a telescope that is designed specifically to characterize the atmospheres of exoplanets. How would you do it and what would be your reasoning on why you would design it that way? Yeah, so I would just, uh, I mean, okay, so you you really give me unlimited resources here, so I'll go, <laughs> go out on a limb here. But 14 trillion US dollars. <laughs> so actually my, my, my needs uh, are usually modest in scientific terms. I wouldn't, if we just had web dedicate a significant amount of time to focus on planets like this, 
for just a couple of years and we have identified a dozen planets maybe there could be a few more order 15 20 whatever but if we can just use web and all its instruments to get complete spectra for planets like these in about two to three years i would think we would get a reasonably good census of what is worth looking at okay so we could boil down the nearest 20 or so transiting haitian worlds the uh, candidate haitian worlds uh, into like a few, maybe four or five very, very good candidates. And then we could do more deep observations even just with web and have the potential to detect biomarkers within this decade. So, you know, you give me unlimited funds, but I don't need them. I just need <laughs> whatever is already available. We just need a, a direction, a, a focus on the right goals. And oftentimes in science, I have found that the challenge I mean, there are challenges in resources, and if we want to really observe Earth twins, for example, then there is a good case to make a very large telescope, like the Habitable Worlds Observatory that NASA is already thinking about, and we absolutely need those facilities for, for characterizing Earth-like planets and detecting biomarkers in Earth twins. But, but if you want to look at planets like these, which are more promising in the near term, then we already have the capability. We just have need the will and the vision to make it happen. Now, uh, sort of an oddball question. This is, this is an ongoing conversation I have with another scientist on, on the show. Yeah. Exomoons. Are Haitian worlds a, a good candidate in order to try to detect an exomoon? That that um, that is an open question. I I would not think so based on just what we know currently, because the one of the promises of Haitian worlds, for, first of all, it depends on the star. Okay, so if you have a sun-like star, and then the Haitian world would be you know as distant from the star as Earth is then sure, you can have a moon. But if you're talking about these worlds around red dwarfs, they're in much closer orbits, then it is not clear if having a moon would be a stable configuration, right? So so it is not clear where that cutoff would be, at what point it would be feasible to have, possible to have a moon around a Haitian world. It, it ought to be possible at some for some stars, because obviously the Earth has a moon and uh, if you place a Haitian world at the Earth's location, it could also have a moon. But it really depends on the star. Now, with K218b, also was mentioned dimethyl sulfide, a weak, weak detection. Explain that and what sigma is that signal? Yeah, so it's it's it wouldn't class as a detection per se uh, of, of any robustness. It is an inference and it is a relatively weak inference, but it is worth mentioning in my view. And the reason I say that is because it depends on how we treat the data. So we are having this spectrum that we built for this planet is made of two observations from two instruments. One is called NERIS, another is called NERSPEC. These are two instruments over different wavelength ranges with a slight overlap. If we took the data exactly at face value and made no changes uh, or not add any offsets in the flux from different instruments, then what we will find is that you can infer the presence of uh, DMS at about a two sigma level, a little over two sigma level, okay, to, to, to 2.4, 2.5 of that type. Now that is not like an insignificant confidence. That 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 is actually quite a good confidence uh, for a non-detection. You see what I mean? Like, you know, if if you detect it, if you found, getting close, yeah, getting close. Exactly. If you found something at two plus sigma, that is definitely worth looking at again with more observations. What we also showed, we actually in this work tried different ways to make the signal go away because we know what is at stake. And, and you know, I have been in this field long enough uh, to know uh, the nuances uh, that go into all the observations and uh, retrievals and so on. I, I, I actually invented the, the atmospheric retrievals of exoplanets. So, so I know the challenges of inferring these things. So what we tried to do is include as much uncertainty into like these offsets uh, relative levels of these data sets as possible to make sure uh, to see if we can get rid of the dms signal 
and we actually succeeded in doing so if we added enough offsets between the instruments. So we had two instruments and in one of those instruments it can further be broken down into two detectors. So we added an offset on each of them and we found that if you allow for enough uncertainty in the relative fluxes between different detectors then you can actually make the signal go away. So you can get, down, get it down to one sigma or even less. So this is why uh, we said that we can't actually claim it to be a detection of any significance. However, we also find that the posterior distributions is what we call the histograms of the DMS abundance that we find are, are not what you would see when you have a non-detection. They all have peaks around significant DMS abundance and it's just that as the detection significance goes down the tails of those distributions get broader and broader. So there were hints for us to believe that there is a possibility of DMS in this atmosphere and it is worth pursuing further with more observations. So that is where we left it in the study. Yes, interesting, worth mentioning worth looking yeah. into further and are you going to do that are you going to try to book more time on jwst or anything you can that's capable of it to confirm this because there is an implication with that particular chemical absolutely so we are already we already have an observation coming up next year for dms and in a longer wavelength range than what we currently have observed and dms has a feature there a significant feature in fact and if it is actually present in the atmosphere we ought to be able to find it and that observation should tell us if there is no dms in the atmosphere and we have to be we should be open to either possibility which is why we are not making a, a significant claim in this particular paper Right. Just opening the door and, you know, yeah. but say you found it. Yeah. What does DMS imply? Yeah. So if we did find it or if someone else found, found it, because there are there is another team which will also obtain observations, but whoever finds it and if we find it, it is going to have major implications for our understanding of habitability and atmospheric chemistry because of two reasons. One is that there is the obvious way to think about which is that dms is uniquely tied to life on earth there is no other way you get it okay so on earth you only get it uniquely from life and biological processes one could make a leap from there and say and actually in the literature people have said this that you know if you found dms on an exoplanet be it a rocky exoplanet or a Haitian world it could be indicative of biological activity on such a planet so that is a prediction I'm not saying it now it has been predicted for years now a DMS as a robust biomarkers so th that would be one way to interpret it but we would we would also want to be more robust than that and open the possibility that maybe we know that DMS is unique to life on earth but maybe there are there is a possibility to make it abiotically in another environment because we don't know much about these environments right Haitian worlds how chemistry operates we are barely scratching the surface at this point so we don't know how atmospheric chemistry operates there so we ought to be able to be open to the possibility that it can pr be produced abiotically in that environment so we also want to do those theoretical studies and prove that actually you can't make it in any other way but life so either way you either find strong evidence for like biological activity or you find strong evidence for a process that has never been seen in the solar system or, or elsewhere and you you discover new chemistry that way so either way to me it's a it's a it would be a win-win for science oh it would be uh dimethyl sulfide as a as a yeah, we, we you know we use earth as our you know it's our laboratory and just because it doesn't happen here doesn't mean it can't can't happen there so it but it, you know in in the case of the Haitian worlds if you started getting a a group of of biosignatures things that were pointing towards it then you go in that direction but if you if you just get the ms then you start asking the question well we've got a you know a little chemistry lab here in this exoplanet what's what could be happening that's the conditions are different but there's one last question there's one last way to make dms and that is industrially could that eventually, if the right conditions are met and the right arguments happen and we go in that direction, could it eventually be a techno signature? No, that, that is a huge leap. And, <laughs> and uh, 
uh, yeah, it would be a huge leap to make that statement for, for multiple reasons, especially on Haitian walls, because here we are talking about microbial life. These are ocean planets with no land mass, and we don't know what the level of complexity life can advance under those circumstances if you just had an ocean without any land mass. So one would think, at least that's our expectation, is that it will be if there is life on such a planet, it could most likely be microbial life, and it would be difficult to associate that with a techno signature. But you know, human imagination has no bounds, so so anything is possible under the in the cosmos in that sense. But it would be too far a leap to make at this point. It would, but I'll bet you at least one SETI radio astronomer, probably many, and I'll bet I know who it is, has turned their telescope towards that system since the release of your favor. There you go. This was this was great fun, Doctor. I really am very interested in your work on this and further study, and I I I think that uh, just finding a new class of you know exoplanet that we don't have in the solar system is absolutely cool. So as this as this goes on, I hope you'll join me again here on the show and uh, we can talk further. Yeah, thank you very much for your interest and uh, really appreciate your efforts in uh, making sure the right science get to the public and that is very important in in the scientific narrative in a civilized society. I look forward to further conversations. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, thank you. Me too. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction John, Author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction Author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing. Be sure. And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Sell out. What? <laughs>